Hey everyone, it's Matt here with Kojo. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the differences between assemblers, compilers, and interpreters, and uh, how that kind of affects the languages we choose. Uh, in an earlier video, I talked about this. Uh, I used this example. This is a partial binary uh, that I built using the GNU compiler on Windows. So at this point, we didn't really know what a compiler was. Uh, I briefly talked about it in that video. Um, I also talked briefly about assembly, right? So this was this was from that same video. This is where I use Intel x86 assembly and kind of show why we wouldn't want to program like this. So uh, what is uh, I, I, I mentioned what assembly was, but what is an assembler? Um, so the fact is nobody really writes in machine code anymore. Well, I don't know if they ever did really. I guess maybe punch cards, uh, but nobody writes in machine code. They don't write in binary. Uh, they don't write in the native code. Uh, what people write in is assembly. And so an assembler is a program that turns that assembly into machine code, into the binary that, that the machine will understand. So machine code instructions and assembly have a one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, and these machine code instructions and the assembly that's correlated with that are platform specific. Uh, and so that means Intel is going to have a different instruction set than AMD, which is going to have a different instruction set than PlayStation or the ARM7. Um, now, things like this, this move command, uh, might kind of be very similar. Like, it's a pretty basic command, moving data around. So that might be similar between different platforms. Um, but the order of the operations, um, the order of the parameters, things like that, it's not guaranteed to work on every single uh, different platform. Um, so an assembler is just a program that turns that assembly into machine code. Now there's very little processing that actually happens uh, except for maybe making sure the instructions are valid. Uh, some optimizations may be possible, but in general, the code that you write, the assembly code that you write is the assembly code that you get. Um, however, or I guess maybe not however, the execution speed is relatively fast. You're writing direct native code. Uh, so. Here we can see this is the assembly code that we write. It has a one-to-one -one correlation to that machine code at runtime. The CPU is directly running that machine code. Kotlin is a little bit different. So here was from that same earlier video. Here's my Kotlin example of that same program. Uh, so Kotlin or C++, things like that, these are uh, compiled languages. Uh, so what is a compiler? Uh, so a Compiler is a program that turns our source code, so our C++ code, Swift, or Kotlin code, into machine code that is directly understood by the CPU. And so we don't have to write in assembly. We can write in languages with um, what are called higher level constructs, like functions and classes, uh, but we still get the benefit of, of running machine code because the compiler turns our C++ instructions, our Swift instructions, into code that's directly understood by the CPU. Um, so the nice thing about this is source code like Swift and Kotlin aren't platform specific. So we can write, we can write code once. So for example, we might write a game once in C++ uh, and we can compile that game so that it works on Windows or Mac or Linux or iOS or things like that. Now that's not 100% true because there's different libraries that um, that have to be connected, but in general that that can happen and that's how games are made. Um, so the source code itself isn't platform specific. Execution is also relatively fast because it's being compiled into machine code that is directly run on the CPU. The, the other nice thing about compiled languages is that more time is spent upfront analyzing and processing the code for problems. So uh, just like before, we're going to get, if we have incorrect syntax, that's going to be a compiler error. So we're going to know immediately before, our, we're, before we're even running our code, we're going to know if it's like, if we do something wrong within the language, we're going to know immediately that it's not going to run. We don't have to wait until it's actually running and possibly affecting our real data to actually, um, to actually fix that problem. Uh, additionally, 
ambiguous code, so code that could mean one of two things. Maybe the maybe the compiler isn't sure if you're doing the right thing or if it looks suspicious because other programmers have had errors like this, we might get something called the compiler warning. And what that the reason it's a warning is because technically it's correct, but the compiler recognizes that uh, it might be doing one thing that the programmer doesn't expect. So we get warnings that help us with that. Uh, additionally, optimizations are possible because we aren't writing the direct uh, assembly code. So we might write relatively inefficient C++ code, but the compiler might be smart enough to look at our instructions and say, this is really what you wanted to do. So this might be the, the order of the instructions that get, uh, they get executed. It might be the order of the assembly fetching, uh, fetching data from RAM. Maybe it kind of batches uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of fetches all at once so that they're all in the cache or all in the registers and then uh, executing our instructions is much faster. Uh, that These optimizations are possible as long as the output isn't actually different. So that's good. Right, so we're not we're not responsible for writing the very low level language, uh, the assembly, which might be slow. We get the benefit of uh, machine code because it's running directly on the CPU, and we get to think in higher level concepts like uh, players and levels instead of just worrying about what the memory is doing. Uh, so a little bit more on compiling. So th in general, this is what happens throughout all of computer programming. So we're gonna edit our source code, and then when we compile, there's uh, three kind of main stages for compiling. Uh, we're gonna talk about these, scanning, parsing, and analyzing. Uh, that's the compiler phase. Uh, we have the additional possibility of linking with other libraries. Uh, I say that it's optional, it kind of depends on the program that we're using and the operating system, but in general, it probably is happening all the time. After we link with the additional libraries, we generate code, and then we run. So at any of these situations, we might get some, well, let's say any of these situations, scan, parse, and analyze, we might get some compiler errors. If, if there's errors during the linking phase, those are just called linking errors, actually. But So we might get any errors related to our code in any of these phases right here, then if we have errors, we come back and we edit and we do it all over again. Uh, so what are the, those parts of a compiler? So uh, the scanning phase just separates tokens. So as you learn a language, we're gonna learn what things are allowed to be next to each other or not. So something like three times X over here or three times X plus two, the compiler is smart enough to realize that the number three is its own piece separate from the multiplication sign, separate from the X, separate from the plus two. So it's gonna kind of be adding spaces in between all of these. It recognizes that the bracket isn't a valid variable name. And so that is separate than any of these letters in index. It recognizes that all of these letters in a row in index are all valid together. So it's going to assume that that is one single token. Uh, after we scan, we're gonna, uh, the parsing organizes these tokens into like a meaningful tree of statements, basically. So a tree of function calls or expressions. The example I have here is that same expression that we had before, that mathematical equation, E equals A times B times the sum of C plus D. So over here, we can see an example of what the, the parser might do. Parser recognizes that that there's two there's two sides of this equal sign. Uh, so we have e equals the rest of this statement. So that's exactly what we have here. Equals the operator is up at the top, and it's going to set the result of this side of the tree equal to this variable. Moving down, we see the multiplication uh, was the the next thing that would happen in that order. So we're going to be multiplying the variable a times the result of this whole next tree here and so on down. Once this tree is built and the code is actually executing, we're gonna be, uh, it's gonna be executing from kind of the bottom up. So because we can't multiply this times an actual plus sign, we would have to multiply b times this sum 
these two elements are going to get added together first. B will get multiplied by that sum. Uh, we'll get a product here. So A will get multiplied by that product. We'll get another product here. And then E will be set to the result of that final product. So that's, that's what I mean by the meaningful tree of statements or expressions. But before runtime, we're actually also doing the analyzing, and that's just making sure that all of the syntax is correct. So what does that mean? It means that we're not using undeclared variables, for example. Uh, this, this statement that I had right here came from a previous video where I had previously declared A, B, C, and D. But if I had instead used F right here, that's F is a valid token it fits nicely into the tree of statements. But if F wasn't declared before we used it, then the analyzing phase is gonna recognize, hey, this, this just isn't gonna work. I don't know what F is. Uh, additionally, analyzing is gonna make sure that we're not, that, that that tree can actually be formed. So if we just write gibberish like C, D plus times B, that doesn't make sense in any kind of meaningful way in any programming language. So the analyzing phase is, is where we make sure that, that those kind of errors get, get figured out. Uh, a more detailed example of what computer programming is, uh, so we edit, we compile, we link, we generate the code. We already saw at the compiler phase, we might have compiler errors, so we have to go back and edit. At the linking phase, we might have linking errors, so we go back, we go back and edit, right? and then we keep going. After we generate the code, we're gonna run the code. If there's runtime errors or, or bugs, then we're gonna go back to the edit phase and, and go back through this whole process again. Once we have code running the way we want, it seems like there's no bugs. We're also gonna, uh, the optional phase is to optimize. So we want it to run as fast as possible or at least as fast as, as we need it to. In general, most, in general, most programs aren't as concerned with speed, but things like games might be concerned with speed. Or if you're just building a piece, uh, a piece of an app, and it just is just running really, really slow, that's something that you would want to uh, potentially go back and edit and optimize. So now we know what an assembler is and what an interpreter is. Um, so an interpreter, uh, so source code isn't translated directly into machine code. It is either going to be directly read by the interpreter, which is just a different program, or translated into an intermediate code and the, the, the interpreter knows how, to, uh, knows how to read. So the intermediate code is also platform independent. So that's the same thing that we get with the compiler. Um, the interpreter is just a program that runs directly on the CPU. And so compared with the other versions, execution of this is relatively slow. So here's two examples. Uh, so without the intermediate code, we might write our source code directly. Um, there may be processing, but typically an interpreter, something like this, is going to be reading code line by line, and, and the interpreter is executing it actually line by line. So it's not looking ahead and, and deciding what instructions could be uh, reordered like there's no optimizations possible here. Uh, and again, it's slow because it, it has to line by line, it has to separate out the tokens, understand if there are syntax errors and execute directly. Um, but again, the interpreter is the thing running the source code. And so the interpreter is, is during runtime translating the interpreted source code into machine code that the CPU understands. Another version of that is uh, something like where, where we write the source code once and then uh, that compiles down to, for lack of a better word, some intermediate code that an interpreter can understand. This happens a lot in Java. Java has an interpreter called the Java Virtual Machine, uh, which is the interpreter is, is a program that's compiled that knows how to be run directly on the CPU. Uh, and the Java virtual machine knows how to run something called Java bytecode, which is that intermediate code. During that phase where we're uh, 
compiling down to that intermediate bytecode, uh, we might have some optimization going on. Uh, things like, again, things like checking for syntax errors is going to happen at this step. So some of the same phases as, as in a compiled language, but you can still see that interpreter is, there's still a layer in between our code, the interpreter and that CPU. So that's all happening at runtime. Uh, web browsers are doing this exact thing. Uh, any, any web page that uses JavaScript is sending you that, that JavaScript uh, and the web browser itself is interpreting whatever that code needs to do and it's executing that on your CPU. So things like Java and JavaScript are both uh, interpreted, interpreted languages. Things like PHP or Bash uh, are run just directly uh, line by line executed by the interpreter. Sometimes these are also, these ones up here, sometimes these are called scripting languages. Uh, so I kind of already mentioned some examples here. Uh, compiled languages are C and C++, Objective-C, and Swift. Interpreted languages or scripting languages, things like Bash, PHP, and Ruby. Uh, things like JavaScript, I mentioned. Hybrid, interpreted and compiled languages, Java, because I already kind of mentioned the Java virtual machine. Kotlin, typically Kotlin is also compiled down to that Java virtual machine bytecode, um, although they do have Kotlin compilers, so it can compile down to native code. Uh, C sharp is kind of the same thing. It's running on the the .NET kind of in. It's running in the .NET environment, so you you build it, uh, you you write it once, and you can run that same code on on Windows as long as .NET is installed. You can run it on Mac as long as .NET is installed. You don't have to recompile it. Uh, for, for these different machines. And that's that really is the benefit. Whereas if I have C++, I mentioned before, uh, I have C++ on that other slide, C++ compiled with the GNU compiler on Windows. That's a very specific setup. The code only has to be written once. But if I want that same code to be run on Mac, I have to compile that code on a Mac. If I want that same code to be run on Linux, I have to recompile it on Linux using, I can use the same compiler, I can still use that GNU compiler, but I have to recompile it multiple times. So I can't just have a binary that was, a binary executable file that was created on uh, on Windows and expect it to run on Mac or expect it to run on my Android or anything like that. Interpreted languages or scripting languages, that's, that's not true. So I can write a bash script, uh, that will, it will run roughly the same on Linux as it does on Mac. And if I have uh, if I have a Unix environment installed on my Windows machine, that bash script will also run there. So if I have Sigwin installed or what are, what do they call it? Like the mini the mini GNU or something like that. Or or yeah, any any kind of Unix bash environment, that same script will run on all of these platforms. Same with PHP and Ruby. Uh, Java and Kotlin that works as long as the Java environment is installed. I can, I can in separately install Java on Windows and separately install it on Mac. I can compile down my Java bytecode, my Java program, uh, on one one time, and I can distribute it to multiple machines, and it's going to run. So as long as the Java environment or the Kotlin environment, those are basically the same. As long as it's installed, then it's it's going to run. So that's kind of the differences between assemblers, interpreters, and compilers. A lot of times we're just going to use the word compile. I think I did it a couple of times during this talk already. Uh, this code gets compiled down to whatever, right? We're going to use that term a lot, and that's really basically what it means. All right, see you in the next video.